Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Ward. And I'm Lori Hartshorn. We are so excited that you've joined us today. On today's program, we focus on the idea of getting that second chance in life. And both of our stories today are about successful people, mm -hmm. but then destructive lifestyles and habits derailed their lives. You know, habits can actually cause us, they're not good or bad, but they can actually cause us to uh, win or lose in life. Absolutely. I think we choose, you can choose the direction you want to go in, yes. but the habits are the thing that gets you there or doesn't get you there. Well, you're absolutely right. There was a great book out, uh, Stephen Covey wrote a little while back, uh, Highly Effective, 21 Habits for Highly Effective People. And uh, I think it's seven habits seven? from Stephen Covey. Was 21 his? from John Maxwell. That was you John know, Maxwell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. But the point that I'm making is business people have long understood that's that right. it's important for them to perform well that's and right. actually do things that are going to give them success. That's right. I don't know why we struggle so many times to translate that to our Christian walk. I know. I think sometimes we don't have intentionality. We yeah. think it's just going to happen. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, if you know someone carrying guilt from past mistakes or trapped in a cycle of addiction, these stories provide hope and show how God is indeed a God of second chances. And there's no better example than Kanda. This is her long road to redemption. Watch. When I was younger, I felt like I was blamed for a lot of things. Anytime there was an issue within the home or anytime somebody would say something, I would just think, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not that smart. Maybe I'm not that good. Maybe I won't ever amount to anything. Kanda grew up believing the world was against her, even God. I was never going to be what God wanted me to be. I couldn't. I felt like he was always mad at me, like he was always disappointed with me. I was always having to constantly go and repent, please forgive me, please forgive me. And when she was molested by a family member at 12 years old, Kanda blamed herself. Did I provoke that? What did I do? What was it about me that made that happen? I did not believe that I was worth love, but I wanted it so bad. And I wanted somebody just to put their arms around me and hold on to me and not let me go. But that didn't happen. It's very hard. It's very lonely. And it feels like something that you'll never attain, something that you'll never have. Desperate, she married her first love at 18, but it was hardly the fairy tale of her dreams. Prince Charming wasn't so charming. It became violent abuse and beating sometimes that I had to call the police. I was so broken. In my mind, I loved him, and that's what love was. Then, Kanda took a friend's advice and became a stripper. Her first night on stage, she was nervous, but not for long. There was cheers, there was all kinds of nice comments. They wanted me. Can you imagine, not just one person, but multiple people at one time. I'm like, yeah, this is it. They like me. <laughs> I kind of left that little girl thinking and feelings and hearts behind and just went full force into this. Kanda went from stripping to full nude bars and eventually porn. By the time she was 30, she was addicted to cocaine and traveling the world as a porn star and high-end escort. I was living in Vegas in Sin City. Penthouse suites, limousines, $5,000 bottles of champagne. I had clients that if I told you their names, you would know who they were. They're athletes, they're actors, they're CEOs. I loved it. It was feeding my ego, filling that need to be successful, that need to be desired. Candace starred in over 80 porn films. At her peak, she married for a third time. He loved her, but he loved porn more. He was addicted to porn in the life that I was living. I was like his dream girl. After 16 years in the industry, Kanda realized she still didn't have what she wanted. I was at the top of everything, and I had everything I thought I wanted, but it wasn't real. I'd done everything that there was to do in the movies. I had done everything there was to do in the clubs. I had done everything there was to do in escorting. There wasn't anything else. It just got to a point where I couldn't, 
stand to look myself in the mirror anymore. I didn't like what I was becoming. And I don't know why, but it was as if everything I was doing just stopped filling the void. Felt like I was trapped, like I was hopeless. I was almost like I was feeling like I was again when I was a child. I got down on my hands and knees before my husband and I said, please, in tears, just wanting him to take me away from all this. He refused, but something inside Kanda wouldn't let her give up hope. I felt like on the inside, like there was something more. It was almost like I heard a voice on the inside saying, I've got something more for you. But I didn't know what that was. Kanda left the industry and her husband when she discovered she was pregnant. Strung out with nowhere to go, she reached out to her two sisters who drove to Vegas to pick her up. By the time they arrived, Kanda had miscarried. God, why? That I was finally gonna have somebody to love me. And I was devastated. Kanda flushed the last of her drugs and returned to Minnesota with her sisters. Still desperate, she accepted her sister's invitation to church. There was nothing left but God. I was so disappointed in myself. How could he be any more disappointed in me? I sat down and I heard the songs. They talked about a God that I really didn't know. They talked about him like he was right there in the room. And it was at that moment, she suddenly remembered the voice she'd heard months earlier. I've got something more for you. I went back to that. Really, could there be something more? I had to take a chance. I said, I want to know you. I want to be different. If you say that there's something more for me, I want to know what that is. Show me. That day, she finally realized that Jesus was the love she had always wanted. I had levels of I was so bad or I had done this so much and I didn't realize that he didn't have levels. He just forgave me and he has filled that void for me. He's the only one that has filled that void for me. Kanda, now happily married and a mother of four, shares her story with anyone in search of unconditional love. There is a God. He does love you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. You have to believe something. Why not believe in him? You're going to believe in something. Why not believe in him? Absolutely. And you know, so this story just reminds me, Brian, that so often mm -hmm. people feel so unworthy, yeah. unworthy of being loved and forgiven because they feel like they've gone too far. You know, and I, I think that is the, the case because uh, when you start looking at Candace's story, you have to also ask the question, what makes us bad enough where we get to the point and it's like, you know what, you've messed up too much? Or what makes us good enough that you got to get the sign comes up and says, wow, you're the greatest. The reality, it's not, it doesn't work that way with God. And he does love you. Today, I really believe that God is going to do a work in someone's heart yeah. after this. Well, you know, as you said that, I thought of Romans, you know, chapter 5, verse 7, 8. Let me read this to you. Mm -hmm. It says, very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person. <laughs> you know, that good person. Though for, uh, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God. But God. But God. He showed or demonstrates his love for us. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know there's no sin that's unforgivable? You could never go too far from God's love. And I just want to invite you now to, to receive the forgiveness that comes from God. Uh, you can be forgiven because God doesn't have levels to sin. He doesn't look at one sin as being worse than another. Can I pray for you now? Father, I pray right now for that one listing that they know that they are worthy of being forgiven, that you love them so much, that there's no sin that 
that is too far from you, that is too bad, that can't be forgiven. And I pray that they would even now fall on their knees and they would say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Yeah. And we know through your promise, Lord, when we cry out to you, you give us forgiveness found in Jesus. I thank you for the death of Jesus on our behalf in yeah. your name. Amen. Jesus. Yeah. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, call that number on the screen. I believe it for you. I felt that in my spirit and say, Lori, Pastor B, it was me. And uh, we'll make sure we get something into your hands. 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. Up next, facing 45 years in prison, David gets a second chance to get things right. Thank you, 700 Club Canada Partners. Merry Christmas from the White Rose Movement, Toronto. Two undercover narcotics agents were waiting for me inside a pharmacy. I resisted arrest and we tore up the entire store. So I was charged with 18 felonies, three misdemeanors, and um, was facing up a maximum of 45 years. Life for David Valsich had always been good until he was about nine years old. My parents sat me down and they said, um, mommy and dad are getting a divorce. You have to decide who you want to go with. And my father even encouraged me to go with my mom. Um, uh, so that was, that was, it was tough. My world was shattered. Bounced back and forth between my parents because I kept being out of control. They couldn't handle me. Got in a lot of fights, just very angry at the world, confused and um, rebellious. I was in and out of juvenile delinquent centers, getting arrested, just running from one foolish act to the next. In middle school, David found weightlifting and football. It helped him vent his anger. That is what just gave me an outlet and gave me some sense of control over some area of my life. Graduated high school by the skin of my teeth and then walked on a Division I football team at Middle Tennessee State University. And the so-called good times of partying uh, quickly spiraled out of control. Steroids was the first thing that actually um, I got into. And when I had some injuries and that led to painkillers and then the painkillers really started the whole thing. Got heavily into drugs total enslavement. With the help of a computer-savvy friend, David started writing his own prescriptions. Anything that would numb the pain of the emotions that were, that were there and the wounds that were there that had never been really addressed or dealt with or healed. After a good amount of time doing that, um, two undercover narcotics agents were waiting for me inside a pharmacy. So I was charged with 18 felonies, three misdemeanors, squandered my education, potential education, potential sports career, was facing up a maximum of 45 years. All but one of the charges was dropped, and David served nine months. But the guilt of losing everything he'd worked for drove him to more cocaine over the next 10 years. It was a, a miserable existence, completely devoid of meaning and hope is the only way I can describe it. And my 20s essentially are a lost decade. Three times he overdosed. The third almost killed him. June 2006, I woke up in the hospital and I was disoriented. And then the doctors came in the room and they said, you're in renal failure. Your kidneys have shut down. We're gonna have to start you on dialysis soon. And once we do, you're gonna be dependent on it for the rest of your life until you get an organ transplant and you tested positive for hepatitis C. And it was like someone had just dropped the payload of bricks on my chest. Utter hopelessness and despair. And I laid there in that hospital bed, reflecting on my life, and just started mourning the wasted years. On the fourth day, they said, we can't wait any longer. You're not getting any better. We're going to start you on the dialysis tomorrow. And that night, I cried out to God. And I said, God, I don't even know if you're real, but if you are, I want to know you. Please help me. Well, the next day, they came in the room around 11.30, and they said, well, we can't explain it, but you've had a complete recovery, and you're being discharged today. <laughs> uh, and I was amazed. 
Wasn't sure what to make of that, but I knew it was God answering my prayer. David moved in with his mom and for the next six months asked questions and sought God, all the while still fighting his addictions. Then at 3 a.m. one Christmas morning, he woke up. I knew I wouldn't be able to go back to sleep. I went out to the living room and I turned on the TV and the Gospel of John was playing the movie. And God was doing something in me. And I just knew that not only did God heal my kidneys in that hospital bed, but that Jesus Christ was real and that he was born into this world. I didn't have this full grasp of the Gospel, but I understood in that moment, in that morning, that, that Jesus died for me and that he was real. And it, it was just, it was just mind blowing. I was on uh, my mom's floor bawling like a baby for I don't know how long. I was asking God for forgiveness of all, all the things that I had done and, and he set me free. Today, David is back in sports as an area rep for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. You know, God is in the restoration business. He loves retrofitting things to adapt them to a new purpose. He also uh, restores to us, redeems things from our past and then uses them. In the, in, in the present, and he reconciled our, our family after all those, those years of brokenness. And where Christmas was once just about materialism, for David and his family, it has a whole new meaning. We worship God together, we read the scriptures, we go to services uh, just to celebrate God and honor him and worship him and thank him. I realized that there was nothing the world could offer that could ever uh, fill that hole in my heart that, that only Jesus Christ could. That's what I hope people will see in this story is the authentic life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Now that's what I call a Christmas miracle. You know, so many times we struggle to, uh, to believe that the past can actually be different. But David is proof positive that if you really continue to cry out to God, no matter how long it's been. You know, I, I, I think many people think that I've been in it too long, but the reality is you're never in any situation too long that it cannot be turned around. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I believe that you have turned to this station for such a time as this. I believe that there's no happenstance, but there's a divine appointment, and then God has that with you today. If you'll trust him, you know, the Bible says something, and I, I love how David's story ends, but I, I, I feel like God says, your story is still in progress. And he says, in verse 11 of the, the wisest man, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he says this, and he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he's put eternity in the heart of man, yet no one can comprehend it. Literally, there is eternity inside of you, and in immortality, that's a gift. You're going to live somewhere for eternity. But eternal life through Jesus Christ is a choice. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now, and I want to get something into your hands. It costs you absolutely nothing, but call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. My only question is, is this. It's not 31 flavors, but are you in or are you out? This is a great opportunity to say, yes, I choose to live with Jesus in eternal life. Pray this prayer. Jesus, I confess my sin. I open my heart, I surrender, come into my heart, I give you my personal permission for your heavenly intervention, in Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, call the number on the screen, one 855 700 Prayer partners are standing by, and today I believe God has done a miracle in your life. Well, coming up next, Dr. Mary Lynn has some tips to help us learn to better self-care. Mm, I'm looking forward to it. Get your copy of Miraculous Blessings, a new DVD from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Pat Robertson teaches you the biblical principles that will enable you to experience the incredible blessings of God in your life. Get Miraculous Blessings now. When Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. He's telling us to value God above all else, then highly value our neighbor in the same way He expects us to highly value ourselves as God's beloved children. 
Jesus assumes we want the best for ourselves. That's how he created us. He instructs us to pursue the best interests of others with the same energy that we pursue our own best interests. In Philippians 2 verses 3 to 5, it says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So my interpretation of this is that selfishness is when you only look after your own interests, not that looking after your own interests is selfish. When you love God with every part of your being, He fills you up with overflowing with His love. And out of that overflow, we give to others. This is a balanced life, the only kind worth living. But notice something crucial. If you don't take care of yourself, you have no overflow. Without an overflow, you'll find it very hard to take care of others and therefore impossible to love others the way we're commanded to. So how do you see yourself? Do you see others as uniquely talented? but not you? Can you rejoice in the gifts and talents of others, but not your own? Do you value and esteem your friends and family, but not yourself? What we see as valuable, we tend to honor, and the opposite is true. What we see as worthless, we tend to discount. When God sees you, He sees you as precious, worthy of honor, and worthy of love. He sees you as co-heir with Jesus Christ, the apple of His eye. When you begin to see yourself as valuable, when you start to see yourself as God sees you, you find the motivation to attend yourself in a way that's worthy of the real you. You begin to honor your body, mind, and emotions by taking good care of them, and God is pleased. The Bible says that every Christian is a temple, holy to God. He commands us to take care of our temple. Too often we limit to things that are obvious. Don't sleep around, don't smoke, don't take drugs, don't get drunk. But we rarely focus on what we should do to maintain our temple. When you take good care of the temple God has given you, you honor Him. When you don't take good care of yourself, when you constantly go to bed late because you're too busy taking care of others, when you ignore the warning signs your body sends you, when you wake up feeling terrible and you tell yourself that that's part of serving God, then you dishonor God and disobey His commandments. As far as I know, there's no verse in the Bible that commands us to stay fatigued for Jesus. So what does good self-care look like? Well, there are three main com components. There's receiving. To stay healthy, you have to receive from others. You must open up your heart to God and others to receive what you need. To practice good self-care, you must learn to let the love of God and others penetrate. Let others give to you and care for you. And number two, attending. Good self-care means you must attend to your own legitimate needs. That means you have to understand what your emotions are telling you about your circumstances and your relationships. It may mean healthy boundaries, and it certainly means resting, having margin, and fueling your body and your mind and your emotions with healthy things. And the last thing is giving. When you keep in mind that God made you for relationships, you stop self-care from degenerating into selfishness. Why? because you realize you take care of yourself so that you have something to give to others. Let me say this as strongly as possible. There's no way you can really take care of yourself without giving and serving others. Love must flow out of you for it to not be stagnant, for a fresh wave of love to flow into you. When you pay careful attention to all three aspects of self-care, you set yourself up to develop deep, lasting, and fulfilling relationships with God and with others. Without nurturing your own heart, you can't nurture the heart of your other important relationships. At the very least, I hope you hear the strong message of how much you are valued by God and that your concerns and questions matter to Him, that He's very interested in you and your heart, that He will be your ultimate protector, healer, and nurturer. Self-care, we could all use a bit of self-care. Absolutely. Dr. Mary's got some good points there. I know I've had to work at that in my life. I like to take care of everyone else. Yeah. You, uh, know? you know what? I think uh, service workers and people that are always caring for people do need to care for themselves. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, you know what? We want to care for you too. And just recently, I read the autobiography of Pat Robertson, and I was really, really inspired. It's pretty, neat, huh? it's pretty awesome. And you know what? We get to be part of this ministry that God laid on Pat's heart that the gospel would go into every home across the nation. Mm -hmm. And that is our prayer to put the gospel and the good news of Jesus in every home across 
across our nation. If you become a partner with us, just $20 a month, we have this fantastic gift, Miraculous Blessings, to give you. But more importantly, you get to help us get the gospel into every home in our nation mm -hmm. so that people can find hope. So give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. It would be such an encouragement. And today, you know, we want to pray for you. Christmas is almost here. And I believe before the year is over, there's going to be a supernatural miracle in your life. But what you have to do, a gift is not yours until you accept it. You got to receive it and say thank you for it. So even as we pray, let's agree. Father, everyone that is saying, I want that new life. I want that new day in my life. As they say thank you for that gift, in Jesus' name, so come on, say it in Jesus' name. I receive it. Lord, let that flow to them and let it change everything in their situation going forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, First Chronicles 16, verses 10 and 11 say, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And now we have a special Christmas song from Stephen Curtis Chapman as he sings Joy to the World. God bless you. is found as far as the curse is 